Alrighty, um, hello, I'm Liam Sullivan, and this is my transition speech. Um, I want to start with my childhood, which I have deemed the good old days. Um, and I define this as basically my birth through the first eight or so years of my life. Um, and I had a very fortunate childhood. It was, it was very uncluttered and simple uh, in the sense that there wasn't a whole lot going on besides me. Um, you know, my, my siblings hadn't been born yet, and my mom, you know, we were fortunate enough that my mom could stay at home and basically give me her undivided attention. Um, and she was great because she basically allowed me to, to just be an absolute fool um, in any capacity that I thought was necessary. I mean, not like a, a bad kid necessarily, but just kind of foolish and childish. Um, so I spent my childhood being a child. Um, and one of the things that I most loved was dress up. Um, it's supposed to appear. Um, Effect. But yeah, I love dressing up. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> I would describe my childhood as uh, very fluid, um, which made it like, very navigable for a young, a young kid. You know, my parents didn't expect anything out of me at a young age. Besides, you know, they expected me to be respectful and just to kind of have a sense of the fundamental decencies and to be a good human. But otherwise, you know, if I wanted to dress up in full military attire and go out and hike a mountain and hit my friends with sticks, that was cool. Um, and also like to dress in drag and put on performances for my younger siblings, that was also perfectly fine. And so I, I grew up uh, largely without conditions and I was experiencing the world um, in any way that I wanted to experience it. And so curiosity was kind of the dominating force in my childhood. Um, and I could have, like, you know, here I'm trying to explore, you know, could I have as much fun kind of being the super masculine, like, bravado character in military garb as I could have in drag, you know, singing to my siblings. And it turns out that I could probably have more fun, fun in drag. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, this curiosity, like, experiencing the world in a variety of ways, in the broadest uh, way possible, um, that kind of defined my childhood. And I was an extremely uh, curious kid, um, and I, I loved life. I had so much fun. Oh. <laughs> um, so that was my childhood. Um, and then from an early age, my mom had introduced me to literature. Um, and it has always kind of held a really esteemed place in my life. Um, and it's something that I've always returned to and that I've always cherished. Um, and so growing up, I loved stories. And you know, I found that outlet largely in fantasy. You know, I, I loved Terry Goodkind, um, Robert Jordan, the Wheel of Time series, um, Brandon Sanderson, and you know, the Mistborn series, and, and all these super dense, like, thousand-page, um, like, fantasy novels. Um, and I read purely for pleasure. I loved a good story. Um, and this was, you know, through my early childhood. I had no appreciation for literature beyond that point. Um, and then I read A Clockwork Orange. Um, and the impact of that book on me cannot be overstated. Um, and this was my independent read for freshman English. And it was Mr. Rush kind of approached me and said, you're going to have a really difficult time with this book because the Burgess, Anthony Burgess, the author, he writes using this, what's called the Nadsack slang, and it's incredibly cryptic, especially to a freshman in high school. Um, and just reading the novel, not even, you know, reading this for the subtext or the subplot, just reading and comprehending the novel is a task. Um, and so, you know, one evening, the evening before the book report was due, I had read maybe 20 pages of this book, and I was having so much trouble. Um, and so I sat down, and I basically read all night. And you know, in the process, laboring over that really intense cryptic language, um, literature kind of opened up to me in the first time, for the first time in, a, in like a very profound way. Um, and it was an experience. You know, the words of the novel, the novelist kind of transcended the pages, and they began to, to impact me um, in a more profound way. And I found that being receptive to the ideas of another human, you know, this author Anthony Burgess, um, could actually enrich my life. And so this was the first experience with literature that really had that impact on me. Um, and it kind of opened me up to the world of ideas. And so this was kind of a, a developing outlet. So much, much like the way I dressed up and exercised my curiosity as a young child, you know, by dressing up and, and like clouding myself in dis, dis, different costumes, um, literature became that outlet for me. Um, and it allowed me to inhabit uh, different ideas and different mindsets. Um, and to experience the world through other people. Um, it's like a game of dress-up, reading literature, because you're allowed to immerse yourself in someone else's identity and then to shed it the next moment. 
Um, and it really is a safe experience, a safe way for you know, a, a developing child to kind of experience the world and to, to kind of hone their ideas and cultivate their ideas. Um, and so this, this quote from Walt Whitman, uh, we're all familiar with it because we read Leaves of Grass together. Um, and right here, do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. Um, and he's talking about what it takes to be a great American poet. Um, but this is what literature allowed me to do. It allowed me to contain multitudes because I was able to take everything that I had read um, and everything that I had experienced in literature and kind of compile it and develop my own worldview and kind of begin forming an idea of who I wanted to be and kind of what I, what I am. Um, and so that's what literature allowed me to do. And so it, it opened me up to the world of ideas. Um, and I began to, to exercise my curiosity through novels. Um, and I fell in love with the world of ideas. Um, and I want to study ideas. You know, I want to, to work with ideas. And I want to uh, continue, continue uh, coming and cultivating my love for um, ideas. And so this, I hope to pursue, so naturally, I'm sorry. Naturally, this would point me towards either uh, philosophy or English. Um, when you think post-secondary education, you know, after high school. Um, and these are both areas that I hope to pursue um, after high school. And so, for whatever reason, there is a, a stigma against hum humanities, um, especially in this, this world right now where everything is becoming increasingly technical and specialized. Um, this, the economy now, it rewards the specialist, you know, a highly technical um, an engineer who can do a very specific task. Um, and the humanities have begun to be overlooked. Um, and there's this stigma against a degree in, in the humanities, in philosophy or in English, saying that you should not identify with a large salary if you want to study, study English or philosophy or the humanities in general, um, unless you want to be a college professor and you want to publish these like highly specialized like esoteric articles in academic journals. Um, and I have no interest in being a professor in either discipline. Um, and so like, that should limit me, but I don't believe that it will. Because what an, you know, an investment in, in either the, in, this, in this career path, I guess, or this, uh, this type of education is an investment in my ability to think. You know, it's not about necessarily honing a specific skill, um, but it's about you know, cultivating the ability to think critically and to evaluate um, and communicate effectively. And it's an invaluable skill, especially in a world where it, 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 everything is increasingly, spe increasingly specialized. Um, the humanities teach you how to think, not what to think, which I really like that idea. Um, and so thinking colleges, um, a liberal arts education is the most consistent with both what I've known um, growing up and what I hope to, to study. Um, my, my upbringing, you know, I described it as fluid in the sense that there was there was really no restraints on me. I could pursue it however I wanted. Um, and I want my uh, college education to, to mimic that. You know, and so liberal arts is really nice because it really is, it's self-driven um, and it's more about what you want to study, not like where you're trying to go. It's about um, kind of the process and it's pretty much however you want to go about that process. Um, and so liberal arts, to define a liberal arts education, um, it places an emphasis on breadth and depth of knowledge, like through a holistic and interdisciplinary approach to learning. And so I won't necessarily be learning uh, how to how to work as an engineer or how to uh, you know get out of college and immediately join the workforce. But I'll be learning how to think. Um, and so these three schools right here, Williams, Dartmouth, and Millbury, um, are all highly selective, very competitive schools um, that represent a really large challenge um, in terms of just at being admitted. Um, and so I've been very fortunate because I've grown up swimming. Um, and when I was younger, that's what dominated my life, is I was a, uh, you know, a swimming zealot. Like, that's, that's where I spent my days. You know, I had morning practice in the morning, um, practice in the afternoon, and I grew up swimming. And I've been fortunate to be successful with the sport of swimming, um, to the point where collegiate swimming is a reality. Um, and you know, I have coaches come to me, and I can come to coaches and say, "Hey, look, I I want to swim for your program," and they, you know, we are able to, to engage in conversation, and that that really opens up the doors for me. 
Um, and while I'm not particularly interested in the sport of swimming anymore, I realized that it's this incredibly powerful tool for me that's going to allow me to, uh, you know, to A, finance my college education, and it's going to help me navigate the, the admissions process. Um, and so basically what it comes down to is I'm willing to trade four years of swimming for a college education. Um, so that's kind of the bottom line with the swimming. And so these three schools are all great. Um, they're all very selective, super competitive schools. Um, and I think that the select, like, I feel bad about this because I have this uh, kind of deficiency, I guess, where I can't, I can't um, imagine myself at anywhere except for the most selective schools. And I think there's a reason for that, the more I dig into it, is because I have this type A side of me that's very competitive, focused, and high energy, and then this type B side that's more relaxed and laid back. And so that's represented really well at these, these small elite liberal arts schools um, because you have that competitive, rigorous um, academic environment, but you also have the liberal arts education and the curriculum where you're able to kind of pursue your education however you see fit. Um, and so I would, all three of these schools have phenomenal English programs. Um, and the philosophy programs are, are comparable. Um, and so these, these are definitely the three strongest. I, I'd be really fortunate to go to any three of these. And they're also, you know, they're, they're set in rural New England. Um, Williams is as far, is in the northwesternmost corner of Massachusetts, which is about as far away from Boston as you can get in Sylvia, Massachusetts. Um, Williams, or uh, Middlebury is in uh, western Vermont over the Green Mountains. Um, and Dartmouth is um, in New Hampshire, kind of way out there. Um, and so these are, these are the three places I love. Um, and we visited these schools, and that's been the really nice thing about you know, being a prospective student athlete is getting the ball rolling on the uh, college, college process early. You know, we, you know, I've talked to coaches at these schools, we've spent some time on campus, and I've gotten to know, you know the curriculums a little bit and, and kind of the areas, and these are the three strongest choices. Um, and so, I don't necessarily know what I would do with a degree, you know, given that I attend any school and I come up with a degree in the humanities, I don't necessarily know what I would do with it, but that doesn't necessarily worry me. Um, because like, I don't have to be a philosopher. There's no place in, in like the modern economy for a philosopher. Um, it's not like a financially viable profession. Um, but pictured on the left here is Brian Stevenson, who is, he's a hero of mine, but um, he is a philosophy major turned uh, criminal justice lawyer when he realized that no one would pay him to philosophize. Um, and he's amazing. Um, but I know it's kind of beside the point right now. Um, he, you know, uh, uh, humanities majors are among those most accepted to, to law school um, because they have this ability to think critically and evaluate um, situations while forming coherent arguments that really deal with really ethical problems. Um, and it's, you know, when you think about what a philosopher does, it's very similar to what a, um, a lawyer does. You know, they, they have to think and present arguments and address big questions. Um, and then on the right is Malcolm Gladwell, who is another favorite of mine. He's a Canadian journalist who has no formal education in philosophy, but the way that he approaches his work is very philosophical. Um, he asks these really fundamental questions, you know, how does one achieve success? Um, and how do new ideas emerge? Um, and the, the job of a journalist, and the reason I love Malcolm Gladwell specifically is because it's about asking a question and trying to develop an answer. Um, and so I'm not necessarily set on being a lawyer or being a journalist, um, but the career opportunities are out there. Um, what's more important to me, you know, it's really not about, um, it's really not about the career. Um, it's kind of a lifestyle choice. You know, I love ideas, and I love thinking and wrestling with ideas. Um, and ultimately, I'm not pursuing the humanities because I'm, I'm working for a paycheck. Um, I'm confident that my ducks will fall in a row, and I'll somehow end up with a financially viable professional life. Um, but the most important thing to me is that like, inquiry and curiosity um, and thinking, really engaged in depth conversations, are part of my life. Um, like I want to be able to, to walk into a room and walk up to someone and have a really uh, in-depth, uh, involved conversation. Um, like that, that's a goal of mine. Um, I, want to, I want to experience the world through the eyes of a scholar. 
Um, and I, you know, that being said, you know, that's kind of the type A side of me, but I also want to to experience kind of the simpler and finer moments in my life. You know, I love cycling. I love spending time outdoors. Um, I think those are my real passions. Um, and so I still want to be able to, to kind of maintain some of those aspects of life. And so on the right-hand side right here is Matt Garish. Um, and I've been very fortunate to know Matt for a while now and spent quite a bit of time around him. He's uh, the father of one of my closest friends, and he's actually a cycling buddy of mine. Uh, these pictures came from a, a ride earlier this year, um, and it was miserable outside, but it was so much fun because you know, we were just riding around cruising. But um, I admire Matt so much because he's a practicing chiropractor who owns his, he owns his own chiropractic business. Um, he's also a cycling aficionado, and he is a dedicated family man. And he struck this really, really awesome balance in his life that I think is enviable, and I think a lot of adults uh, look at him and, and envy him because he's got it figured out. Um, and I don't want to emulate Matt. I'm not trying to be a chiropractor. Um, but I, I really admire the fact that he's been able to preserve his personal passions um, while maintaining a very prof or very successful professional life. Um, you know, I all I hope that uh, all I hope for my future is that I'm able to strike a similar balance um, because that's really what's important to me. Questions for Liam. What's going on with you in that picture? Oh, it's very muddy. <laughs> like I, said, I call it a spa day because it's kind of like a free uh, mud mask or whatever they call it. <laughs> Did you guys, were you doing cyclocross? No, we were just riding on the road. We rode up like up through Ellsworth and, and around, came back through Trenton. You just like when you're riding in a pace line, it just kicks up so much dirt. So. And there, the person in front of you is kicking up mud in your face, and you're kicking up mud in your yes. face. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. The ride up, I was, uh, I was mad because I, everyone else had more dirt on their face than I did, so I made sure that I stayed behind someone's wheel on the way back so I could get as dirty as possible. <laughs> but, um, other questions for Liam? Hi, when you say that you um, like talk talked to the coaches at like Dartmouth and Williams like what if, do you mean that like they want you to go there yeah so like the the so the athletic recruitment process is a little different for every sport but junior year is when you you open up conversation with people and you know so we you know they'll either reach out via email um, or you'll reach out to them and express an interest in their program and then they kind of they you mean you talk to them and you get to know the program um, in this school, and so that's that's a really fun thing, actually, and that's something that you know I don't like. I I really I think it's a really rewarding experience to be able to have that early introduction. Um, yeah, that sounds awesome. So yeah, so you know, just you know, get to know them, you know, call them on the phone sometimes. Um, it's really it's really pretty awesome. How do they find you? Um, so there's a variety of like networks out there. There's CollegeSwimming.com, which is a um, it kind of it's like a database basically of. Um, like the recruits coming through like their respective classes. Um, so they can search for you on there. Otherwise, a lot of times, so I've, I've reached out to several of these programs. Um, like Williams was, I initially reached out to Williams um, and initiated a conversation with them. But you know, USA Swimming's got a database of all the time. So they, so they kind of, during in the spring, they kind of go through and they start to kind of evaluate potential recruits. Um, and so I, I, I think the, that's an invaluable thing for me because that's going to allow me to pursue what I want to pursue. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any friends who do sports at those, any of those schools? Oh, yeah. So, Williams, actually, there's a, well, Rob Benson, who most of you know him, he swam for Williams. He's an All-American for Williams. Um, and he's awesome. Uh, he's obviously not there now, but um, <laughs> he's swam for them in the past, and so we've talked quite a bit about about the school. And then another girl, a local girl who swims for, um, she swam for Bangor YMCA. Her name's Emma Wydell. She's gone to Williams, and she's like a, she's crazy. She's like a five-time uh, individual national champion. Um, she did some really awesome stuff there. Um, Dartmouth, I actually, we have a couple kids from the school. Winslow's brother, Clifton, goes there. Um, and then Auden Curlis, I think, just graduated. Um, from Dartmouth? Yeah. Wow. Um, and I don't actually, I'm not sure I know anyone who is currently enrolled there, but Middlebury, Will Green goes to Middlebury, and he, 
he rides bikes for them. Um, and he studies conservation biology. Um, so when we visited, he kind of gave us the lowdown and took us around. Um, but he rides bikes. I, I would hope to, to ride on their club team if I, if I end up there. But yeah. Do you think it helps if people from our high school are actually at a school and they know like ins and outs and a little bit of it. No, but they know a little bit like the, the college knows about our high school. I'm not actually sure. So I think that um, that's a good question and I'm not totally sure on that. I think like with the athletics, that's certainly helpful. Um, just because, you know, they put a word in for you. But otherwise, I'm not sure if it I'd be curious, actually, if that has any impact on, you know, if they notice that they have, like, a large number of kids from this one area, if that's a big at play at all. I don't know. Because there's so many, you know, you guys ever notice how many students we have at Wheaton? So many. There's a lot. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And a lot of places, like, in there are Other questions? For Liam. Thank you, Liam.